Amsterdam first. We're uh, we're hitting Amsterdam first, and then uh, and then we'll head to uh, Geneva, and then up to uh, to Lisbon. Nice. So for all of you, uh, Jorge is an alumni of the school uh, and is a member of one of our boards. So. Okay, we have a few more participants coming in. Uh, Niels, welcome. How are you doing? How is Zurich doing? Hey guys, I'm very well. Hello everyone. Welcome everybody. We just were going to wait for a, another minute or two and allow some additional people to join us before we get started, but uh, feel free to say hello in the chat. Okay, participants are coming on board. <clears throat> Once again, welcome everybody. Uh, we're just gonna wait another minute or two. We still have people joining us. Feel free to uh, say hello and tell us where you're joining us from in the chat. Well, hello and welcome everyone to today's strategic roundtable, the strategic thinking, deciding and implementation process. We're grateful to have you joining us today. We have a, a nice large group uh, in our audience today. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, and, um, you know, we're happy to share this uh, timely and important topic with you all. This meeting is being recorded and all the resources will be shared afterwards uh, with all of the attendees. Uh, please put your questions in the chat. Uh, as we go along and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. For those of you who didn't all sign up, uh, there will be a Google form uh, that we'll post in the chat as well. So I'm happy to be here with you all today. Uh, my name is George Edwards. I'm the Chief Accreditation Officer at the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. The host for today's roundtable is Dr. Christoph Ott. Christoph is a member of the board of the Lausanne American School in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, he has an extensive background in enrollment management in international markets and guiding organizations to achieve long-term goals. Forward thinking and innovative strategic thinker with an ability to cross to build cross-functional teams, develop comprehensive programs uh, and improve service quality. Uh, excellent person interpersonal skills and effective collaborator with students and adults skilled at introducing new, and innovative ideas into secondary education and implementing them through empowerment, motivation, and inspiration. So now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Christoph and to our panel. And again, thank you all for being with us today. Yeah, thank you, George. Um, yeah, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. We have people from 
a pretty broad spread geographically right here. Um, so let me maybe quickly introduce uh, George here. So George is my co-host today, and he is the Chief Accreditation Officer of the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, where he assists schools throughout New England and around the world in the process of continuous improvement by participating in accreditation. George was a public school educator in the USA, serving as a high school principal for over 20 years. George has been the founding principal of several schools, including some explicitly designed uh, around the NEASC standards. George lives in Snappy, um, New Hampshire. I said, I hope I pronounced that correctly, George, by the way. <laughs> so, okay, let me maybe set the stage for everybody to understand uh, uh, where this idea came from and why we're even talking here today. Um, so this strategy round table emerged uh, from the NIASC annual conference uh, where I was presenting around uh, planning in the times of crisis and George was my co-host or my host for that session. And out of that presentation, as we were preparing for it and as we were uh, you know, uh, debriefing afterwards, we sort of realized uh, that most people uh, or most schools, I would say, um, either uh, will reinvent the wheel or they will uh, hire uh, people specialized in that field, but they don't really talk uh, with each other. So um, it's basically my pleasure to welcome you all to the third uh, strategy roundtable. Uh, the first two, uh, which were also recorded, and if you wish to have copies of recording then of the of the resources, just feel free to message me. But the first two, one of them was about co-creating with high performance teams. The second one was around community engagement and the role of communication. And uh, the topic we chose today with George was based on the fact that um, we all have a long summer ahead of us, which gives usually time for deeper dives and a bit in more in-depth research. So we wanted to really uh, look at the strategic process in itself. And as a basis of conversation of this process, uh, I'll be referring to the, the strategic thinking process that we use at the Lesson American School. But uh, before we dive into our discussion, let me introduce our panelists. So Jorge Flores, if you can give a wave so everybody knows who you are. There we go. Uh, so Jorge is a um, leader, advisor, investor, and philanthropist based in Boston. Uh, with more than 15 years of experience in financial services, Jorge has built a thriving wealth management practice serving business owners, high net worth families, and a special focus on cross-borders investors seeking wealth management advice in the United States. In addition to serving his advisory clients, Jorge also serves as a managing director for a Boston-based venture capital firm that seeks to invest in disruptive technologies, founders, and companies with origins in Latin America and a vision of expanding their market share in the United States. Jorge serves on the U.S. Advisory Board of the Latin American School, where he co-chairs the Financial Committee uh, and the Scholarship Endowment Fund. And Jorge and his wife, also a serial entrepreneur, enjoy traveling, dining out, and brainstorming ideas to disrupt new technologies. Thank you for being here with us, Jorge, today. Dan, My pleasure. Dan Music is the Director of Professional Growth and Strategic Engagement at the Dalton School in New York City. And he is the owner of Forest Craft Expedition, an expedition outdoor camp in the Adirondack State Park in New York, where he just came from of this after this weekend uh, out in the mountains. Dan has over 20 years of uh, teaching in outdoor education setting and in English science and wood carving with independent schools and currently a member of the senior administrative team at Dalton responsible for strategic planning and project management. Dan has extensive experience in um, evaluation and strategic planning, including logistics and operations. He helped create the last strategic plan at Dalton and is responsible for managing key strategic initiatives, such as professional growth and review, including developing professional leadership track within the school and the Dalton by Design, a K through 12 curriculum alignment partnership with Jay Matai, author of Understanding and Schooling by Design. Ben, thanks for taking the time from New York to be with us today. And it's a, it's a particular pleasure to welcome Jeff Bradley here. Um, Jeff is the NIAS Director for Accreditation and School Improvement International and serves as a volunteer NIAS Commissioner and visitors from uh, 2009 and 2015 before NIAS. Jeff gained experience in executive search and consulting, assisting schools worldwide with leadership recruitment and development, strategic planning and governance. Jeff also co-founded Oasis uh, Group, a US and international partnership of K through 12 thought leaders and practitioners aimed at sparking conversations and innovations to support best practices of teaching and learning in an increasingly globalized world. Jeff was the founding director 
of the school year abroad slash Italy uh, and served as the headmaster of TASIS, the American school in Switzerland. Um, and he earned his BA in philosophy uh, and MA in English literature from Georgetown University. And um, it, it is particularly uh, nice of, George, of Jeff, sorry, to be here with us today. This is Jeff's second webinar today, and his first one was at five in the morning. His time was the new head of the International Baccalaureate Organization. So he's a, he's, it's, it's going to be a long day for you, and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. <laughs> My pleasure. Okay, so why don't we dive right into it. Um, Jorge. Um, here is maybe for all the panelists, the outline of the strategic thinking process that we use at LIS. It's, it's a, a relatively standard uh, process where you start with a situational analysis, which is the dark green bubble on the top. You then brainstorm various scenarios. And once you hit that point three, which is the yellow bubble, you focus on the common possible future. After that, the last three bubbles are focused on strategies. Uh, and tactics and assessment. So you enter into that implementation phase uh, of a strategic plan. And it's a merry-go-round because you're basically always doing strategic thinking as opposed to, uh, you know, I would say maybe the, the great leap forward, the plan that will, uh, you know, uh, solve all problems. That's just not how the world goes and that's just how, how schools are. So I've asked Jorge to focus on the first three points um, and then we'll uh, focus a little bit more on the last three points, so points four, five, and six, and then Jeff will give us the general overview. So um, Jorge, why don't you take it away from here? Will do. Thank you so much, Christoph, for having and George for hosting, uh, co-hosting us. This is a, an amazing panel. I'm happy to be the uh, the outlier here, um, not in education, but uh, very passionate about it. Um, if you can hit the next slide, I know we're, we're going to be very tight on time, so I want to make sure we, we, we get through as much process as possible. So uh, as Christoph mentioned, really what I'll be covering is the application of the first three steps that we have used uh, in venture capital uh, specifically and you know how we are always looking for disruptions, as uh, was mentioned in my bio, I think. If you're a thoughtful disruptor, then you really become an area of, uh, you, you, you get to expand your 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 broad base of, uh, of open-mindedness and ability to think outside of the box. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> when we start with the, uh, the where are we, I think it's always important for an organization to ask themselves, where are we as an organization? Are you executing on the things that will separate you from the pack, right? So um, I, I, at one point, and then in the next slide, there's one quote that continuously resonated with me as I was kind of thinking about this uh, panel today, which was, you know, you, you can't be everything for everyone. So you need to understand what it is that you do best, stick to it and charge a premium. And we'll unbox a little bit of more of that in a little bit. But as an organization, are you executing on the things that will separate you from the pack? Meaning it's great to put things on paper, but then what are what, what metrics are you using to put in place to hold yourselves accountable? And many of those things can include uh, forming a, a strategic board as uh, the Liz and American School has done. You know, uh, if you look at the, the dichotomy of that particular board, you see all walks of life, all different experiences. And, and what's even more interesting is it's it, it spans multiple generations. So uh, it, it's been a very proactive uh, board in which we're able to share ideas and, and brainstorm them. And I think uh, Christoph and, and his brother, Mark Frederick, have done an excellent job in putting the framework uh, for this board to, to kind of think outside of the box. With respect to uh, the leadership team, are you aligned with the goals of the organization? So, I mean, if, it, if there are things that you're not necessarily within your beliefs, you have to question, all right, what has to change? Right. Um, as venture capitalists, we're trying to continuously align with looking for companies that are within the thesis of our investment. Right. What, what are some of the things that we're passionate about? Uh, there is a huge piece on social impact, but it's not the only thing that we look at. Uh, our particular um, uh, execution of what are we, what are the things that we are executing on is is really you know being able to put to put a metric on it. So, for example, for us is creating a fund and being able to invest that capital to Latin American startups. How do we do this? Well, we rely a lot on our investor network, right? What are you guys looking for? Okay, some are way out there and other ones are very much, yeah, this is exactly what we want. Can you introduce us to more? Um, can you go into the next slide, please? So this next one really kind of goes to what Christoph has really been working on and, and, and as a school and applying you know, what we see in venture capital and what we 
have brought from you know thought leaders in venture capital and uh, education uh, and other uh, I think even we have some engineers on, on on the board is that that type of thinking of where do you want to go right why you why does the competition want to choose you like you know what what is it that's going to make you stand out uh, again you know Christoph asked me to draw the parallels um, between you know strategic thinking and, and education as institutions are involved uh, with what we what I do professionally. And, uh, you know, here's where I had just made an allusion to of you can't be everything to everyone. So when we got to the round table, we had a very uh, fruitful, uh, almost three hour board meeting as our initial kickoff, and we had a lot to unbox. But one of the things that was a recurring theme is, you know, okay, are we an art school? Are we a uh, a sports school? Or are we just only academics? Is there any other kind of thing that we're going to, that we'd like to see at the, at, the, at the school to be a leader in or a thought leader? And I think the consensus was something they were already kind of tooling around with, which is entrepreneurship and innovation. That was, you know, icing on the cake for me because that was my jam. That, that is something that uh, I think is what the future holds. So as far as the why you, well, we are preparing high school students to be thought leaders within their early years of college education, even though they're uh, mostly, uh, you know, your, your, your core studies in the first two years, but at least giving them the opportunity to kind of think broadly and, and, and apply innovative uh, solutions to the studies uh, along with their application. Apply the app, apply the things they're learning along with ideas that they may have to create something. We're now entering a, um, a, a period in time where a lot of things are going to become automated, right? So it's more important than ever to really understand how are we preparing our future generations of, of, of entrepreneurs to think that way. You know, if everything's being automated, how do I remain relevant in life and 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 uh, being part of society? So again, uh, you know, universities have built a complete business model around the concept of what, it, you know, what are you going to do really well and, uh, and you're going to charge a premium for it. You know, a great example here in the Boston area, you have uh, roughly 130 universities <laughs> within a, a 30 square mile radius. Um, so it's very, very competitive. But you start to look at some of these great institutions like Babson, who says we are the number one entrepreneurial school. Then you have your MIT, who is everything engineering. Oh, and by the way, we also offer uh, an MBA uh, to help you tackle, you know, bring your your technological ideas to life as an entrepreneur. Then you have Harvard Business School, which is just HBS. Is, you know, it's what you get for being first to the show. You get to you know, kind of dictate the pace. And, and the, the theme continues. So really, as a, as a school, you're trying to really think about what's going to differentiate you. And I think this is something that is heard across the board. But I can't stress enough that this, this application goes to everything. It's not just the institutional, uh, sorry, education as an institution. It's across every sector. Uh, the next slide, please. So where could we be? So for us in venture capital, we're always looking to maximize uh, every door that we open. So for every door that we open, we want to understand how can I 10x, not just the investment, but how can I 10x opportunities? How can I 10x my pipeline? So the same thing would apply in education where what are the things that you're doing, as we alluded in the previous slides, as an organization, as a leadership team, to 10x the results that you want to bring your, your school to, your institution to. Um, you know, what we found to be very helpful are collaborations outside of your immediate ecosystem. This is going to lead to the thought leadership. This is what's going to... You know, you, it's not expected that one institution or one group of people knows everything, but collectively or collaboratively, you start to really bring in some really interesting ideas. Uh, I, I've kind of always been uh, on, on the, of the school of thought that, you know, what are colleges for the future? Is there a future for colleges? Are they hanging on for dear life? And I've seen kind of the pros and cons of, you know, white papers that I've read in recent years where, you know, are, are students now really going to be focused on specialty certifications? Well, we want to make sure that even at the earliest levels of education, you're, you're teaching them to think critically so that if they do go that route, they're not going to be ostracized for not having the, you know, the traditional four-year degree. Or if they do have the four-year degree, how are we going to build you know, on that and incorporate those teachings from university into the things they want to do professionally? Uh, one of the easiest things is, uh, you know, well, not the easiest things, but a great place to start is start with the end. Like, what, what, what does that end look like? What does success look like? 
and then start backtracking and filling in the, the, the filling in the spaces. Uh, I've included a um, uh, actually the next slide will be pretty interesting. So to kind of answer some of these things. Oh, actually, sorry. Good point. Theory versus reality. So theory is great to organize your thought, but you really need to have a framework. As Christoph has kind of showed with the rubric here of you know the, the, this process, it, it's not it's never going to be perfect, but at least it's a framework from which you can you and your collaborators can work within. Uh, finding experts out of the ecosystem and then seek out interests with parallels to yours and see if there's an ability to adapt ideas, best practices or outcomes to yours. I included, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit, two things that I feel are very, very helpful. Um, you know, one of the things that continues to have a huge impact, not just for me personally, but uh, also for my, uh, my, my business associates, is a video that I continuously draw our attention back to, which is uh, the famous Start With The Why video by Simon Sinek. Uh, I can't tell you that even, I think it's like eight or 10 years old at this point, it's still relevant and it's still, it's still a challenge for many people to even answer who they are and why. I encourage you to, to YouTube it. It's look for like the 18 minute version. I think it's the second most watched TED talk in the history of TED talks. Uh, Simon Sinek is a thought leader and I think how he deconstructs the concept of why it is what we do uh, it's very inspiring. And, and I tell you, if I don't watch it, you know, at least once a quarter, and I, this has been since I discovered it years ago, I, I, I'd say like I'm, I'm having a bad quarter, but I, I think it's something that you need to continuously draw your attention to. The other thing that I found really useful uh, across two now different in, in financial service, but across two different pieces, one in wealth management, one in venture capital is the business canvas. And um, I, 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 I I'm curious to see how it, it's definitely adaptable, adapted, adaptable to education, but you can also start to understand, you know, the frameworks within which you're working in. And we'll, we'll share a link shortly to, to see as I do uh, a lot of, um, I guess, mentoring in this space where I have in the past, where how would we use the canvas to disrupt and um, the disruption so much is not how much do I construct a business, but for example, for business development, I talked about a 10x factor. And if you are, I see a link just went up for the, uh, oh, sorry, that's something else. So we'll share the Canvas link, but what, I, what I'll draw a parallel to is like, you know, the left side is like, who are your customers? And then who are your, your, your key partners? And understanding like, what if you were to either A, reverse those and be like, all right, who are my key partners? And how do I open a door for them to find more customers, right? So that's one, one contact, right? So if I, uh, if Christoph tells me he's looking for, for someone to expand a, a campus globally, well, you know, I may not know that one person that, um, that does it, but I know that we have a realtor that does a lot of global work that deals with a lot of educators and, and, and relocations. That would be a great resource in that respect where Christoph would now meet one person that would open 10 plus doors for, for him. Right. So I think these are uh, a really good resources. And then I think a great book that has also had a great impact. And, and, and uh, I've read it now one and a half times is uh, Think Again by Adam Grant. Uh, for those of you not familiar with him, he's the youngest tenured professor at the Wharton School. Yep, gotcha. Uh, he, at the Wharton School. And uh, I, I think he, he brings a lot of relevant points that are not so business oriented, but it's more broader scope and how it has applicability across many sectors. Um, so that's that's the, the venture capital perspective in terms of strategic thinking, and you don't really need to reinvent your, the wheel. In, in summary, it's really just surrounding yourself with great collaborators that will help you to think outside of the box. Wow, Kote, thank you, thank you so much. This is uh, yeah, su super impactful, and this is like, at least for me, you're preaching to my choir on that one. <laughs> Uh, and, and I saw I saw Jeff smiling because I think he's referring to Simon Sinek, probably the same video in his presentation too. So it's it's good to know that you know like-minded resources you know float yeah. across the across different industries across different areas of the globe. It's um, a must watch. It's I mean it's amazing. I love it too. And I, actually, I did not occur to me to watch like every every so often again. I watched it once, loved it, and moved on. I think rewatching it is probably a good good booster shot. Uh, no COVID pun intended here. Sorry, a good booster shot uh, uh, for everybody. Um, and I think I, I think here's what I took out of this. And then maybe if some of the other uh, panelists would like to comment, I I love this approach of looking at what the big boys are doing, like universities, bigger university, bigger bigger institutions, more sophisticated institutions uh, in and outside of the educational industry. 
Um, and if you, if you combine that with being an anthropologist of your own families, your own customer, of who, who, who are your customers? What do they want? You can then put this together with, into what you used before, which is a value proposition. And once you have that, um, you know, strategic thinking, and, and I've said this uh, a number of times, and a number of you have heard this again, strategic thinking is not rocket science. <laughs> it's an effort of contextualization and alignment of, of efforts. And once you get those two things together with a clear sense of direction, um, you're literally pulling all at the same rope and you have this, this, this opportunity to do 10x, whatever 10x means for your school. But it just gives you that clear positioning and that clear uh, um, forward-looking vision as an organization, because the biggest challenge in the school, as we all know here, is um, you're asking people to, to like build a plane while they're riding a bike, uh, because the school is in operation, the teachers are teaching, the administration is busy running the day-to-day -day thing, um, and it's hard to carve out that time. And I'm pretty sure it's the same in other, in other industries and other, other, other companies too, but in education, uh, this is something that's always struck me of being particularly challenging. So, um, so yeah, thank you very much, Jorge. Anybody, uh, Anybody of the panelists or George would like to just bounce off of what uh, Jorge just said? So I just want to add, um, I, I really love the parallel um, that we use in education quite a bit about thinking about the end and what you want the end to be, whether it's thinking about what you want your school to be, or maybe more importantly, thinking about what you want your students to know and be able to do, but thinking about the end and then planning backwards from the end. Um, that, that parallel really struck me. Yeah. Um, Jack, I saw I saw you got your hand up. Would it That's be right. possible for you to hold on to your question so we can touch it at the end? Uh, because I want to make sure all the presenters get enough time. Or you chat, put it into the chat, or you uh, or you just hold on to it. Is that okay? Perfect. Will do. Thank you. Okay. By the way, this is true for everybody. We, we welcome questions. We want that dialogue at the end. By the way, I'll, I'll announce it right now. Uh, all the panelists have been generous enough to, to stay on this call after one hour. Uh, we can just have a bit more of a free, free floating conversation. We'll, we'll stop the recording. We'll have about 10 minutes after the hour uh, is done if you wanna ask just directly questions to, to the panelists. And afterwards, I would obviously share their email addresses with you if you wanna take it uh, offline. Uh, but I think um, I, I don't see any, any head wobbling from either Jeff or Dan. So if that's all right, I'll just pass it on right to Dan. Hello, everybody. So I'm Dan Music. I am the Director of Professional Growth and Strategic Engagement at the Dalton School. And that is a role that came out of our last strategic plan. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the, the implementation of strategic initiatives and priorities uh, from a higher level. And uh, like I mentioned, my job came from the strategic plan. I helped project manage that uh, five years ago. We're, we're getting close to our next strategic planning process. But in that last iteration, um, I helped the then head of school, Jim Best, manage the plan, uh, you know, all the data that went around that, the thinking that went around that. And what came out of that was a clear need that somebody needed to be in charge of some of these big initiatives. So that, that became me, thankfully. Um, can we go to the next, go next slide? So when we created the strategic plan, it was exciting. Um, it's a great plan, a lot of wonderful initiatives. Um, and we, we quickly ran into the issue of how do we organize each individual initiative to completion? And as a starting place, um, we as a school in those early days had struggled with a concept of more is more, meaning that we did a lot of stuff. There were a lot of plans happening, a lot of initiatives, almost to a detriment. So we scaled back and started thinking about um, how, how does change impact our school and how much can our school handle uh, individual change or strategic projects at a time? So if you are unfamiliar or have not heard of first order, second order change, this is a place that we started a conversation. First order change being the idea that um, it's, it's upgrading or enhancing something that you're already doing. You can do a lot of these first order changes. They're low impact, they're low demand on people and systems. Um, think about like updating the software, um, your, an update on Zoom or any other software that you're using. It's a quick update. It doesn't have a major impact on your life, but it's a nice incremental change. A second order change, on the other hand, is a significant change or it's a creation of something new. It has a higher impact on an environment, on a school. There's higher demand on people and on systems. 
And so a school can only handle a few of those at a time. Um, but if your, your schools are anything like ours, we tend to take on a lot. Everyone has a, initiatives or ideas. We tend to take on a lot without having a good overview of what, how that might impact us. Um, next slide, please. So I took that idea and I expanded it to the notion of if we think about impact, so these are strategic pro, uh, projects, these are new initiatives, these are things that are happening in our school, what impacts the school as a, as a school-wide initiative? so that it's strategic or long-term commitment. It affects the entirety of the school and it is time and resource dependent. What might affect only a division or department um, still has a high impact. It's still time and resource dependent, but with a smaller group of people. And then what might be discrete initiatives that affect a smaller group of people and smaller moments of time. And by thinking about these three categories, what we were looking for is if we're going to roll things out, what is the actual impact on the individuals within the school, the individual faculty members, staff members, or even the administrators? Next slide, please. So this brings us to this past year. Um, we have several strategic initiatives that were in place, but this past year was a really good example of impact of strategic ideas and initiatives on a school and what, what effect that has. Coming out of the pandemic, starting a school year, we already had a fairly stressed faculty and staff body. And people were getting even more anxious and stressed because the amount of demands on their time. So I took that last slide, that idea of school-wide, divisional, and then discrete initiatives, and I started to create a chart like this, mapping out what is happening school-wide and what, what are the stressor points for individuals. And what we found quickly is at the start of the year, just returning to school was a second order change. For most of our faculty, it was a brand new schedule. That's a second order change. For most of our faculty, they had brand new classrooms. That's also a second order change. We were looking for a new head of school, new director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so we had five or six second order changes right off the bat. And then we get into the strategic initiatives that were already in place. <clears throat> Dalton, Dalton by Design was mentioned, which is a K-12 initiative that's affecting all of our faculty. Um, we have different PD that are in place, whether it's assessment or making care in common. And then divisionals and then on down to discrete um, smaller groups. I asked our administrative team then to take this list, which was actually much larger than this, unfortunately, and think about an individual faculty or staff member in your division or department and apply each one of these categories that might, it might impact them directly. So if we took someone in the middle school, they have to have all the blue because those are school-wide. If they're in the middle school and some of those green or middle school related, they have to take on those. And then what else are they involved with? And once we did that, we realized, of course, they're stressed. They have no time to do their own job. And we're asking them to do these whole other jobs on top of it. So this process starts to give us an overview or where is our school culture at the moment to be thinking about how do we effectively move any new strategic initiatives in play? And that's an important overview to have. Next slide, please. So as we think about what is the condition of our school for a new strategic initiative to move forward, then the question is who's responsible. That's where my job came out of the strategic plan. Um, I am solely um, responsible for certain key initiatives so that that's, I have the time and space to move those forward. This has been important because when our strategic plan was put into place, um, we, have, we are now going into our third head of school in those five years. So in that time, some of these key strategic initiatives would have fallen away if somebody hadn't been point on those, uh, on those initiatives going forward. Um, initially, when I came into this role, I had these initiatives like the Dalton by Design work or professionalizing the Dalton leader, but I wasn't quite positioned to lead because I may have had division directors who had either uh, greater capacity or they had the right people in front of them that I didn't. So it took a little bit of time to position me in a place where I could be in front of the uh, department chairs, for example, and lead curricular initiatives. Um, and then from there, each year now, as I meet with the head of school, we talk about what are our measurable outcomes for the year and can we actually hit these targets given everything that's, that's in place. So with these two things in, in mind, what is the condition of the school and who's responsible, we can start making better decisions about what we're actually capable of delivering on in a particular strategic initiative or, or goal. Uh, next slide, please. So the third component that we, that we think about with each one of these is aligning our initiatives to mission. And this is an, uh, a pyramid made by Jay McTighe and Grant Wiggins, if you're familiar with schooling by design or understanding by design. 
Their premise is backwards design and curriculum. And it's also within schooling by design, thinking about the foundation of how you move anything forward. Um, and it should be grounded in your mission and your philosophy, as well as learning principles, and then informed from there. So any new project we come on, we look at what is the conditions of the school to move it forward, who's responsible, and then ultimately, is it mission aligned? Um, from there, if it's meeting all those conditions, then we can start to put all the project management data in place for it. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so that's my main takeaways is how do you measure the impact, who's responsible, and our initiatives um, mission aligned. It's interesting, Jorge, uh, I also had Simon Sinek as one of my resources. We think about the why all the time, so clearly his, his uh, message is resonating with folks. Um, and with Jay McTie, using both of those voices, Jay often talks about um, the banks of a river. And it's important to have clear boundaries within what you're working in in a project so that your river stays contained. Now, it might ebb and flow, but it doesn't spill over into a floodlands. And those boundaries can be the conditions of the school, the person who's running it, how the project is managed. But we often keep, keep those two things in mind. What are our boundaries to a project and why, why are we doing them? Um, the last thing I will add that is emerging for me is when I got this role, what was key about me in this role is that I, I could manage projects well. I had good relationships with people in the school so I can call on people and, and form good teams. Um, I'm good at visualizing information, but a key skill that's coming out now that I'm finding more and more is the ability to understand data within your project management and moving that forward. And what I am finding is as I deal with data more, our school culture doesn't understand data in the same way. And so as we start to use data to inform our projects and move initiatives forward, there's a real tension between how do we communicate and um, how do we move something forward in a way that everyone can understand and feel in a positive way. So that's something I'm keeping my eye on is how, how data is being used and understood by the school culture. All right, I think based on my timer, I've hit 10 minutes. How are we looking, Krista? You are spot on then, my God, you're, it's like a Swiss clock, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think I'd like to, like that last point you just made, uh, that data point and that measurability uh, out of IT, the world is what is your definition of done? Um, it is, it, it, you know, and I'm an engineer by training, so this is coming more naturally to me. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it is a real, real challenge in the school uh, context. Uh, and I think there's a real educational opportunity for the community around this because it gives everybody a, a much better transparency. It takes a little bit of that fuzziness out of, out of that, that, um, that art that it is to, 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 to impact kids. Um, I think that the two other pieces that I, I really, that really resonated with me uh, of what you were saying at the, at the beginning was, um, again, I'm, I'm I'm a big fan of IT and, and they're not always good at, at proper English. So all the English majors uh, on the call, please excuse me. But one of the words they love using is smallify stuff. <laughs> so you've got this BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. And then you have to just break it down. You have to smallify it. You have to use different levels of analysis, which you, you beautifully portrayed with your three levels. Um, and then, you know, more is more. Well, how do you prioritize? How do you use things such as Kanban boards, uh, for example? You know, Business Plan Canva is great at the at the at the, the phase that George was talking about. But like for me, I'm a, I'm a big fan of of Kanban boards and visualization of processes uh, to help people understand where they're at and what's still left to do before they've reached their definition of done. And that is a very very soft way also to bring data into the equation. So uh, so I, I very very much uh, love what you said. Thank you so much. Any other comments, uh, George, or any of the other panelists? No? Yeah, I think okay, uh, so. if I could just say something on the data, I think the data is really important, but you know, going to one of the earlier points as well is, is finding collaborators to help you dissect that data. You know, when you're, when you're too ingrained in your own world, you don't see what you don't see, right? And having those external partners uh, help you bring light to things that you may not have either seen to be an issue, a challenge, or even anything uh, worthy, you know, taking a, a deeper look. And uh, I can't stress enough how important collaborations outside of your own ecosystem are. And, and this data is, is a great example of how to pull those external partners in. 
because it's simply a, how would you dissect this? And, you know, and then that's where the juices start to flow from the creative process and going back to this framework, why just having a framework is very important because it'll keep you guys on track, but, uh, but also you're inviting uh, outside of thought and not getting too stuck in group think. So those are my, my, my two cents. And I, I love, you know, the, the, the three pieces here that uh, we, we just covered as well. And I think what, what Dan, because Dan and I have had a number of conversations around strategy and strategic initiatives and entrepreneurship uh, this year. What you just said is 100% spot on, Jorge, but I think um, it should not be underestimated how much the internal legitimacy and those internal relationships and empowering people internally to do things, because otherwise you might end up being the bottleneck of change. Uh, you can't do it all yourself. And it really only sticks when you're able to make, you know, common best practice, common practice kind of thing. So I think you touched on that at the beginning, then when you started creating uh, or describing how you, uh, you know, how that role was crafted out of a, a real need at Dalton. And so I think that's a huge point there too. Yeah, and I, I will add to that. I mean, when, when you think about if you're the head of the school or you're a division director, there, you just don't have the capacity to think about um, the process of leading a project through, the ability to stay on top of it, there's too many other demands. So to be able to have somebody else who can move that forward, who does have the relationships in the school to build good teams um, and to keep something on track is, is vital, uh, especially for these larger multi-year uh, projects. Yeah, definitely. So um, George, unless you have anything else you would like to add, I think I'd like to hand over the word to Jeff, uh, who's gonna give us the, the big picture. Uh, and help us contextualize this uh, specifically uh, in, in schools or one specific school. Jeff, uh, right. please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. And hello, everybody. It's good to see uh, a lot of familiar faces and names um, on the call today. So uh, let me share from my perspective uh, in response to this invitation, um, a little bit of perspective from, from where I sit. And I've, I've had really um, an amazing ride in my career um, just in the last um, 10 years or so where half of it has been with NEASC where I've been traveling around the world uh, um, working um, for the organization. Right now we're accrediting or in the process with about 350 schools in 85 countries. Uh, and that number continues to climb 20 to 30 schools a year. Uh, including right through the pandemic. And before that, I was um, a recruiter, uh, help schools with strategic planning throughout the US um, and, a, and a little bit abroad as well. And that's when I joined the commission first doing, doing visits uh, for the New England Association. Why is that significant? Because every time I would land on, at a school, um, I would pick something up. Um, and I, I, at some point along the way, realized that what I'm kind of doing here, and anybody does when they travel around to different schools, um, is they are a pollinator. They are landing, picking up some ideas, maybe dropping some ideas off, and then going on to the next place and doing a little bit of the same. And so every place I go has added to my kind of store of knowledge and understanding about schools and also given me examples to share. So when um, Christoph approached me about this um, session today, I had a few examples, um, you know, one that I could talk about for as long as the one I am going to talk about um, in the U.S., but I'm going to talk about one um, in Europe. And, um, and I know there are lots of approaches to the practical work that goes into creating a strategic plan within a school. Um, because I work within a particular framework at the New England Association, I'm going to share with you how one school approached the um, challenge of developing a strategic plan and aligned it elegantly, I would say, with the accreditation protocol itself. So to give you just a, a one minute um, introduction, our accreditation protocol that I'm referring to, ACE Learning it's called, takes the foundational elements, the compliance oriented things like governance and child safety and finance uh, and policies and makes it part of the foundation stage. So that's dealt with early on in the process. Uh, and verified or not. There could be some things that need to be worked on on an ongoing basis. But the main effort, the main 
time for the internal reflection and efforts of, of the staff and everybody else in the community is on learning. And the way we look at learning is through the lens of 10 learning principles. So um, I know many of you already know this. So George, if you wouldn't mind putting up the slide with the 10 learning principles. And these are um, our statements behind which there is a lot of material for each one of these learning principles. And those of you who have already studied the learning principles will see some different words here because we did make just a few little updates in 2022 uh, that we're gonna be rolling out uh, in the coming months regarding these learning principles. So if a school is doing a plan um, and kind of thinking in terms of uh, three to five years, that's a good idea because that aligns nicely with the uh, strategic planning as we see it within the accreditation framework. Our accreditation cycle is also on a five-year cycle. So um, many schools find it makes sense to align developing a strategic plan with doing an internal reflection, especially when it's a school that really wants to focus its efforts on learning and make that really the center uh, and core of what they're doing. And when I say learning, I mean not just getting good grades um, and using a particular curriculum, but on deep, in, deep learning that is focused on impacts. And impactful learning is what this whole ACE learning protocol is about. And it's a way for schools to challenge themselves uh, and expand their range as learning communities. Um, as they look at these learning principles, gather evidence for them, seek to um, embrace them more, more fully. So in one case, and I, I was uh, on the team for this school, it was one of the first schools that went through the full ACE uh, protocol in 2017 and 2018. And what they came up with, and let me just describe for you, each of these 10 learning principles, a school must gather evidence for and rate itself on a continuum, on a kind of spectrum. Um, it's not met or not met. I mean, that's what we do with the standards, you know, that you have a child protection policy that everybody is trained on or you don't. Um, that's not what we're doing here. Here it's, are you thinking about this learning principle? Are you working on it, developing some things? Are you actually doing the work? Are you doing the principle? Is it, is it living? Is it existing? Is it present in your, in your community? So it's a, um, a subjective judgment that a school rates itself on this little this scale. And then the visitors do the same thing. But the work is really saying, where are we and how do we know? So what is the evidence telling us about our alignment with this learning principle or not? That's part of the internal reflection. That's what they do for the self-study. Here's where the strategic planning part comes in, because what a school has to show after going through this internal reflection self-study process, what they show, what they put in their report that we review before the visit, and then we have it kind of, you know, in our left hand as we're having the visit and the, and the, and the conversations and meeting uh, students and all and visiting classes um, and writing our own report. But their report, the school's report says, not only here's where we are on the spectrum, but here's where we want to be. That is, here's how we want this learning principle to be expressed in our community. And the most important part is the bridge, getting from where we are today to that future vision of that impacts we want to see in our school. That bridge are the plans or the major learning plans, we call them, to move a school from where it is today to that future vision that it spent time in the early part of the process defining for themselves. So those major learning plans are the bridge that get you from the, today's where we are to this imagined future. So in that context, if you would, looking at this slide, I know that you may have to put your reading glasses on. Um, if you look at number um, five, learner autonomy and engagement, number six, learning principle six, research, reflection, and action, um, and number 10, learning space and time. So just using these examples to kind of narrow the focus a bit here. Um, so those three happen to be ones that were, uh, this school was in, in particular, um, uh, particularly interested in developing and cultivating and enhancing. So George, if you go to the next slide, here are two of the major learning plans that emerged in 2018 or 17, 18, when this school was working on its major learning plans. So what emerges number two, okay, this is major learning plan number two. 
build a dynamic culture of coaching and collaboration that speeds the pace of learning for students, faculty, and staff through meaningful feedback and engagement with experienced mentors. Now, what they've done is said, okay, we want to have this shift in our culture. And here is more explanation of why with, notice what's in parentheses, with in parentheses, the learning principle that they are being driven by or that they are inspired by, or that they want to align with. And it could be a chicken and egg. We may have inspired them. Um, they may be you know, inspired by us, um, or it may be an add-on um, that they align after the fact. But what we've seen in this particular case with, with this school is a series of learning plans, major learning plans, each of which touches one or two or three or more of the learning principles as a way of th for them to say, here is the goal that we have, this embracing this, this major learning, uh, sorry, this um, learning principle, and here are the plans that are gonna get us there. The second one down there, number three, transform student assessment. There again, and they've identified two other learning principles, uh, learning principle two, which is all about learning dimensions, that learning is not just about cognition, it's also about creativity, et cetera. Uh, and also learning principle three, which is all about assessment. So now, George, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that today what this school has in place are eight strategic directions, including the two that I circled with a red, culture of coaching and transforming student uh, assessment. So to this day, tracking from 2017 when they first did the work, they have um, enhanced, improved, developed, and, uh, and cultivated this stuff so that come next year when they're back to their uh, um, internal reflection, um, it's, it's, it's a process. They, they just show us where they are in the development of this. And if you click on the link, George, or, or take us to the website, this is a school that actually has a pretty uh, enhanced website that has a um, uh, series of links, which we're not going to go into. I've got about one more minute here with you. But uh, just to give you an example, um, and we'll, I think we can post the, the link um, in the chat it's, as well. With It's already, it's already posted, uh, it's okay, I posted it a bit early, but it's already in the chat for everybody. Good. To see. Yeah, no, and, and Frankfurt said it was, it was fine to share it and it's, it's on their website. And it's a way of clicking through from the, from the, from the goal, a culture of coaching um, through to the um, different initiatives that they've undertaken. Um, and their website includes a video clip that explains um, where we are today with this, with this initiative. Um, and then below that is the sort of more standard um, strategic plan where they track the various um, initiatives timeline wise, uh, et cetera. So George, if you just click real quickly on culture of coaching. And you'll see if you scroll down, they're enhancing the, their understanding of this. They're indicating what the actions are. And these, by the way, have evolved since what they first you know, said in their report, um, but they're telling the world basically and themselves, here's where we are with this plan. And this is a way for us to say, don't let accreditation just be an every five year thing, make it part of the work that you do. And you can do that now as a learning community, because these are the learning principles that you're, that you're working toward and that you're developing. And, um, and, and, and this would be an example that I would put out there for anyone saying, you know, what is the connection between strategic planning and accreditation? I would give this example in this model, the school that shows really great, I think, balance um, and, and um, inclusion of a lot of voices uh, within their community. So I think I've run out of time, but I appreciate, again, the chance to uh, share a little bit of this and do a little bit of pollination here. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. This is, uh, this is amazing because it, it brings it all together in the best possible way. And I think what I'm taking out of this right now is uh, that last, especially that last part, you know, I mean, obviously accreditation is critical friends helping you on a pathway. It's not normative. It's not telling you this is how it has to happen. It's like, hey, what do you want to do within that standard, that, that learning principle? And then you work your way towards it. And then it's uh, the rubber hits the road kind of pieces when it becomes a reality. And um, some schools and not NIASC or it's not, it's not within NIASC or outside of NIASC and not finger pointing here, but some schools will, will 
you know, fall more into the checkboxing exercise of accreditation as opposed to really taking it for its full value. And what, what you showed with Frankfurt International School is something that we talked at our uh, previous roundtable, which is communication for engagement. And that website is, is, is huge. And you said yourself, that's to show to the world, but actually I'm pretty sure that a big chunk of this is to show internally uh, what you're doing to keep people engaged, keep people accountable. When you, when we, if we refer back to what Dan was saying, so we have a champion for each of those initiatives. Um, and the magic word you use, and these are magic expression you use, but I'm going to use my words here, is continuous improvement. Meaning, how do you keep this? How do you sustain the momentum? Everybody does a huge rally cry before accreditation shows up. How do you keep the momentum going once the accreditation visit is over? And I think uh, it's a fantastic example. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. I, I, I also like the icons, you know, because we're, we're visual people. And so each of those strategic initiatives has 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 an icon, which is which is memorable. And, and I think that's, you know, one one effective way to um, enhance the communication and the alignment um, and understanding. So I'd like to maybe open it up to just questions uh, from anybody, uh, panelists or participants. And uh, Jack, you had your hand up at the beginning. You've been very patient with us. Uh, thank you very, very much. If you want to go ahead and just uh, throw your question to the panelists uh, and let's see what comes out. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for the presentation. Um, I'm a very hands-on person as a civil engineer and love project-based learning. My question is a little bit provocative and I wonder how do we apply these concepts that we've been talking about? How do we give up this pyramidal structure? Maybe something a little bit more horizontal. How do we actually engage with community partners, experts in the field? How do we recruit teachers who are really skilled at what they're doing and can be paid for what they're doing? The list goes on. Uh, my question really is around the application. Thank you. Wow, that's, that's a big topic right there. And I think uh, we won't cover it with the time that is left, but it's a very, very relevant and, and one I think that is, is at the core of many of the things because it talks about student agency. Um, and I think if, if it is all right, because uh, I know that either Dan or Jeff could, could answer that question, but I think Dan and I having gone deepest around the context of Dalton, if Dan, if you want me to just give a few pointers of things, and again, we can take this conversation a bit deeper uh, after after the session is over, but I think it's a very relevant point. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at it. Um, you mentioned the pyramidal st structure, first of all, that was the, the, um, the diagram from Jay McTie. And what was important about that is decision making comes from having a clear mission and set of values for your school. Um, or for your organization. And by working in that way, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to stay at the bottom. He, you know, he talks about backwards design too. Everything sort of leads into that core. Um, so part of our question would be when you think about faculty or initiatives, how, how, does it, how does it serve the mission of the school and how do you make decisions around what is mission-driven and aligned and what isn't? Um, you know, I, this year is an interesting year, obviously coming out of the pandemic, when we think about faculty and we think about our school environment, because it actually has forced us a lot to, to reevaluate much of what we're doing. And many, many of the initiatives that we started two or three years ago, we have to rethink about, um, are they still serving us? Do they need to change in some ways? Who are our faculty now? And what do we need to think about for them? So keeping to the core of what is the mission of the school um, and reflecting on that has actually helped us in those, those thinking processes. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what comes up for me. Yeah, any, any other panelists? Uh, Jeff, if you want to bounce off or George uh, out of this, and maybe there's time for one or one or two more questions before we wrap it up. I guess the only thing that I would add is, you know, right now we, we talk a lot about student agency, but I think um, providing the adults in the school community with agency is also important. You know, how can we, you know, really empower uh, the people in our learning communities, the uh, the adults, the the teachers, the staff members, the parents, um, to you know create that kind of horizontal structure, Jack, that you're talking about, so that it's not you know so so vertical. Um, I, I think that that's really a key to moving um, moving a school forward. Yeah, I, I think if I can just 
uh, piggyback on what you just said, George. It's, it's you can't, top down does not work in a school because we're not producing widgets. The magic happens in the classroom. So you have to, you have to, there's no way around not empowering the people on the ground in, in the trenches. And I don't like those war analogies to be honest, because it's not a war, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's more like a journey of a mountain. So how do you, how do you empower the guides uh, of those learners, of those kids? And how do you empower the learners to be learners? uh at the same time so you, you you can't go top down but at the same time you have to give a sense of direction and coherence to things and that's where the alignment that dan spoke about is is, is quintessential so um, i i hope that this gives enough just as food for thought we won't be able to answer everything i'm just seeing um uh shaima has a question and i'm also seeing a question on the chat that i'm having a hard time reading okay i was maybe let's take the question on the chat if i may briefly um i was wondering if all these new age values and goals can really be implemented in the traditional educational system a 200 year old system personally i think pbl is the best base for these awesome new age ideas and goals um jeff you want to take that one maybe briefly sure yeah i mean it's we're not going to be able to do this in the next minute and a half but it's a really good question. Uh, and it's like many questions I think that we're asking of schools and of ourselves today in this in this system, um, which goes to the question of, you know, what wh what is school for? And um, I think the, you know, whether PBL project based learning or problem based learning is the right way or not, I would I would take a step back and say, I, I'd love to have that conversation, but I first want to have a conversation with whoever's in the room uh, answering a question of what is school for? Because if school is for uh, you know, university preparation, then I don't know if PBL today is the right approach. And if it is, then we got to do something about that articulation to the next level. If we're talking about you know, global 60 million displaced people with a lot of them children, and what school is for for them, then that's something else. Um, so it's a much bigger question that's on our minds quite a bit. You know, while we're having these conversations today, you know, uh, this interesting timing today for with me with the IB this morning and this this afternoon, uh, our our associate director Trillium Hiblin is uh, doing a, a visit to Amala, which is a, a school that is um, based in refugee camps. Uh, seeking accreditation for its diploma program. So, you know, we're we're asking these questions all the time about how do we um, cultivate a good and effective long term deep learning uh, in communities. Anyway, again, yeah. a topic for another day, I'm sure. Thank you, Jeff. But I think it, it you know it's it's uh, it's 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 interesting. Um because everybody has their, their pet peeve was in education and I got mine too, you know, and PBL is something that's close to my heart, but before zooming in onto a solution, taking a step back and figuring out who, who, who you were targeting and what your problem is, uh, is probably more important first and foremost. But um, last question from Shaima, uh, if possible, and then uh, we'll wrap up this portion of the, of the recording. And then those who want to stay on, we can just take it, uh, take it from there for another couple of minutes. Shaima, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Actually, my question is an extension to the pet peeves of education. It's because I am always wondering about community focus as an assessment driven uh, world. Like uh, Jorge said in the, in the beginning of the session that we should be focusing on entrepreneurship and innovation. But at the end of the day, when students apply for universities, the universities ask for grades a lot of internal, international, uh, standardized assessments that students have to take. So at the end of the day, how do I, as a school leader, manage to balance the focus on innovation, entrepreneurship, and the readiness for a global world, and at, at the same time have those students very well prepared for their external examinations? Because at the end of the day, whether it's accreditation or internal inspection, uh, I will be held accountable for the students' scores. So yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a tough one, but I I, I do know uh, through a mutual friend of ours uh, with Jeff, uh, and his name is Rick Pacheco out of Madrid, that Jeff has spent an inordinate amount of time with the Spanish government to make them buy into the ACE principles because it is so exotic to a traditional educational system. Um, but I think Jeff, you're probably the best one to give a, a, a few crumbs uh, <laughs> around this because Shama, you're right. How to prepare people for university and still prepare them for life? 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the case of Spain, there are dozens, um, probably more than a hundred now of um, alternative um, lower schools, primary schools that don't use the full Spanish curriculum and therefore must be accredited by a non-Spanish accreditor. And that means follow that, that, that line of logic. That means that Spain needs to recognize what's going on in those schools being uh, accredited by an outside accreditor and that's us. So we had to say these schools are doing some alternative um, project-based work, most of them um, exclusively that, that, that kind of work. Um, it doesn't look like a Spanish program at all and it's not a Spanish program, but it's still a quality education. It's still um, preparation for their future. In fact, it may be better preparation than what the other kids down the street at the public school are getting. We don't say that to the authorities, but we do say that New England stands behind what these schools are doing. Now, not all of them make it. Um, we don't stand behind all of them, but we, we have them all go through the same standards, the same foundation standards, the same learning principles. And um, last month, uh, we spent some time in the ministry explaining a little bit more about what we're doing and how we're monitoring the quality in these schools. And there was acceptance and agreement with what we're doing. So I think that's where the an outside organization like NIASC and others can be very, very helpful. So I'm seeing uh, some people have started jumping off this call already. So I think, um, George, if you'd be so kind to maybe just do a little bit the, the, the conclusion. I have also the announcement for the next round table and the topics we're going to cover. We can then uh, disconnect the recording, stay on a few more minutes for those who have time to take this further. Uh, and then, uh, and, but I first and foremost want to thank everybody for taking the time for being here. I know it's, it's, it's late in India and it's, uh, it's much earlier uh, in California. So, uh, you know, it's, it's taking the time out of your busy days, especially towards the end of the school year, is, is very much appreciated. And I hope you're getting value out of these roundtables. Yeah, thanks, Christoph. So make sure I'm unmuted. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to add my thanks to our panelists and to everyone who attended today. Um, again, a very uh, interesting and timely conversation. And uh, hopefully, uh, you all found it uh, as uh, productive and as helpful as I did. So, um, we look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. I'm going to turn the uh, recording off now.